What does disability look like? Does it look like this? Or does it look like this? And to answer that, it's yes. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Faith O'Leary. As, as Sally said, I'm 22 years old. I'm about to start my master's in psychology. And I have a disability. I know, it doesn't look like it. Um, I've got, it's called systemic lupus erythematosus, or just lupus for short. Um, it's where my immune system can't tell the difference between my body and bacteria, so it kind of just attacks everything. Um, as Sally said again, I'm also a thyroid cancer survivor. Um, I have a blood disorder called ITP, and I've recently been diagnosed with avascular necrosis, which is bone death due to loss of um, blood flow to my elbows. Um, so it's been a crazy past couple of years. But yeah, disability looks different. So what is a disability? Well, a disability is defined by the Miriam Webster Dictionary, mm -hmm. is a physical, mental, cognitive, or developmental condition that impairs, interferes with, or limits a person's ability to engage in certain tasks, actions, or, pre or participate in daily activities. So basically, that's a very broad definition. That can include anything like depression, um, um, eating disorders, um, Lyme disease, I wrote, um, having amputated limbs like the women we saw earlier, um, diabetes, bipolar, so it could be mental or physical. So disability is not one thing. For a disability fact sheet, so I've got some things, statistics here. Approximately one in five people in the U.S. are considered disabled. Um, to kind of bring that fact home, that's 18% of adults over 18 in Illinois alone. That's a lot of people. Plus, there's the factor of invisible illness. So there was a survey done in 1997 um, by the census that reported that 26 million Americans reported having a disability, but only, only 7 million reported using like a cane or a wheelchair or a hearing aid. So what that means is you cannot really tell the rest of the people um, the only way you can tell a disability is by those aids, but if you have something that, you know, like lupus that doesn't require a hearing aid or a cane all the time, you can't tell. So, invisible illnesses can cause immense suffering, but it's, it happens internally. It's not something you see on the outside. So that means a lot of people who suffer with chronic illness, their pain is internalized. Because of these statistics about how wide chronic illness is and how much and how prevalent it is, that means it's really likely that people in this room have a disability. That means it's really likely that people in your pulse studio have a disability. That people you encounter at competitions have a disability. And it means that many pole dancers have a disability. Now we talk about pole dancing. In our community, we value and praise athleticism. It's true because that's what it's built on. That's what the sport is built on. It's very competition based, a lot of you compete, um, and it's really social media enabled body focus. So a lot of you post things on social media, and it's about showing people what you can do, which is awesome. But like, can you imagine having a disability? So not only can you not do your day to day activities, but you also are trying to keep up with things that many able bodied people can't do. Well, they can do incredible feats. So it's a lot. So what the hell do we do about that? <laughs> so here is what I think is how to be a great ally to people in your community that have a disability. One is make the space inviting. And I'm gonna say that people in my studio and the places that I've been to actually do really good at this. It's made me feel really welcome. Saying like, hey, if you have an injury or a disability or struggling with something, we can make these moves accessible for you. Um, that's something that's really been awesome with me and my pole dancing journey that I've appreciated. It's just welcoming the space and saying, anyone can do this. Um, work with people and meet them where they're at. So, kind of goes along with the first one by saying, let's not expect you to be up here with all the other able bodied people. We're going to meet you where you are and we're going to build you up. And that's really incredible. Be encouraging and remind us of our strengths. Um, people with chronic illness can get really down on themselves for not being able to, you know, compete with everybody else. It's really hard. So remind us of the things that we can do. Like, yeah, you can't do this pole move, 
but here are the ones you're really good at. Like, here are the things that you can do with your disability. And reminding us that, yes, we can't do what everyone else can do, but there's still a ton we can. Um, also, learn our language. That's really important. I would really recommend researching the spoon theory. Um, it's this idea this doctor presented to kind of conceptualize how people kind of live their day-to-day -day lives. So she basically said that she described a spoon as a unit of energy and saying that, you know, able-bodied people have unlimited energy, but people with a chronic illness have limited spoons. So you can tell your friends, like, I've got 12 spoons today, and that means showering costs one, so a lot, no more energy there, getting out of bed costs one, making dinner costs one, and so saying, like, how many spoons do I have for pole dancing today? So it's a way to kind of connect with people and say, like, hey, how many spoons do you have today? And, like, as a person with chronic illness, that means a lot, because it says, I researched your condition, I researched your community, and I understand you. And that's going to be incredible. And then raise awareness. This is for allies and empowered disabled people, too. Just talk about it. You guys are all here tonight, so you're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> now, how to be an empowered spoonie? How to be an empowered sick person? That's what we call it, shows. I would say be on your own journey. Focus on you and what you can do. Everyone else is doing their thing, and that's great for them, but they're on their own journey. You can't compare yourself to able-bodied people. You can't even compare yourself to other sick people because chronic illness interacts with our bodies completely differently. Um, I know people with my same condition who have completely different health conditions, health problems, um, and um, abilities than I do. And that's fine because it's different for everyone. Second thing is know your limitations, communicate those limitations, and stick to those limitations. So learn how to be an advocate for yourself and say no, because that's okay. So know when to say no and know when to say, I can do this and make time, but don't push yourself, it's not worth it, your health is more important. Listen to your body. Listen to how it feels when you dance. Listen to how it feels when you eat. Listen to how it feels when you're with certain people and act accordingly. And lastly, ask for help if you need it. This is something that's very hard for me, but super empowering. Like, it's okay to say, hey, I can't do this pole mover. I can't, I'm having trouble with this. And people can help you, a lot of people help you. So I talk about empowerment a lot, and that's because I think pole dancing's super empowering. It's been very much for me. Um, I tried to find peer-reviewed journals for pole dancing, and surprisingly, I didn't find any, but this is from my, my own experience. But pole dancing is super empowering. It makes you feel sexy, it makes you feel strong, and that can mean a ton to someone with a chronic illness. Um, it's great social support and community, as you guys all are familiar with. The pole dance community is super tight-knit, and super loving and accepting, and that can be a great buffer against the isolation that chronic illness causes. Um, so I think it's really important for sick people to be able to be a part of this really tight-knit group. Also, pole dancing, to me, gives, helps me with a sense of embodiment and feeling like my soul and my body are connected. And that is such an important feeling for someone with a chronic illness because oftentimes the relationship with their body can get really severed because of the pain that's caused us. And to be able to feel like you belong in your body and that you're strong in your body is kind of incredible. Um, so this feeling of connection is, is great, especially for someone with a chronic illness. So that's why I believe that people with a chronic illness may have trouble fitting into the pole dance community, but we can, we can meet each other where we're at. We, I believe this is totally possible, um, and it's really beneficial for both um, people with a chronic illness and for able-bodied people to be able to relate to someone who's not like them and to give us all a greater understanding of other people who are different than us. Um, and finally, like I said, pole dancing is super empowering, community building, and it should be used. People should be able to accept. Pole dancing should be accessible to all people. It might not look the same for everyone, but everyone should be able to participate. Um, so let's work together to build an accepting community, keep talking about it, um, keep having these amazing forums, keep accepting other people, keep asking, keep being curious. Um, and finally, be empowered. Be empowered as an able-bodied person and be empowered as a sick person because we're all people and we're all joined together for something that we love. So, yeah. That's all.
bit topical. Um, obviously, it'll be personal questions, but you know, be reasonable. Don't ask anything like invasive, and our presenter reserves the right to not answer your question. <laughs> All right, carry on. Do you want me to pick the people, or you got it? I do. You got it. Okay. <laughs> Anybody? Well, you might get get off that free for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to phrase it, but I don't want you to leave before I can make the word down. <laughs> um, so do you see choosing to study psychology uh, as a continuation of this sort of self-empowerment from Holdenism, or does that connect somewhere else in your life? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so my specific study for psychology is I want to study sexuality and religion, but I kind of clump pole dancing into sexuality. Because um, like I said, embodiment is a really important um, piece of that for me. Um, yeah, I like the idea of like sexuality being a part of being okay in your body. Um, and I want to say that in religion specifically, um, because I think there's a lot of like mess with that. Um, so it is, yeah, I think pole dancing is the way I practice my academia, if that makes any sense. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that, in, you know, I guess this depends on how many different kind of like movement modalities you've tried, but do you find that pole dancing is more accessible to you as a disabled body person, <coughs> um, than like other forms of fitness or movement? I think it, de it de yeah, it depends on the movement and it depends on the day. Okay. Um, like I have done a lot of other sports. I used to be really athletic before getting sick. Um, like bike riding is something I really like, volleyball is something I really like. Um, but like again, like my, my knees is a really big problem. So like volleyball is a squat a lot and that's not always great. So like the thing that I really like about pole dancing is depending on which part of my body hurts, I can work around it. Um, so like I have like arm issues, so now I'm like, okay, let's do things that work for our legs. But if my knee hurts, like okay, let's only do upper body today. And so I think that'll allow for like a greater flexibility. Um, like I showed that picture of the woman earlier in the wheelchair, like she can't use her legs. So she's like, okay, just arm as it is, you know? And like, so I think it allows for greater flexibility. Yeah. How have you kept yourself in a positive mind frame throughout all of your diagnoses? <laughs> um, oh, that's hard. I'm not always a positive person. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, community is really important and knowing like yeah I'm going through this but like it's not just me um, yeah I've I'm really I'm really grateful I'm growing up in the age of the internet because like people with lupus are just like a search away you know like I've been like support groups online um, and I'm in like Facebook groups and you know I connect with people on Twitter or whatever and one of my favorite things to do actually is when I'm like having a really bad clear day is like I Google the tags on like or like on Twitter, and so I just search people complaining about their illnesses, and it's like, oh, like I'm not the only one having a bad day. Um, so just I like the sense of community. I think I'm a people person, so like um, knowing that like I'm not the only one suffering, that's okay. Yeah. Um, training. Um, whole training. I'm doing a year and a half, so coming up on two years in the summer. Yeah. And I've been sick for almost five years. Mm -hmm. Also in the summer, yeah. Um, so pull dancing came a lot later. But Did yeah. you do something early in your diagnosis, like any other activities? Not really. I was really, like I said, I was really active. I was a huge bike rider. I used to bike like an ungodly number of <laughs> miles in a week. Um, and then I got sick, and the first thing that went was like my ability to walk. So it was like, all right, sports are cut. Um, so pole dancing was kind of my way back into fitness, I would say. Because um, I found working out really hard. So I was like, let's try and work out without like thinking about working out. Um, so yeah, I was kind of like my transition back into the fitness world. All right. Yeah. How did you discover pole fitness? <clears throat> um, I think I saw it online or something. Um, I thought it was interesting because like I, I started seeing videos about it or whatever 
Uh, I think, and because I'm my, my interest in research with sexuality, I've heard a lot about like people who do like um, stripping and pole dancing, and I was like, that sounds really interesting. And like I didn't like thinking about like keeping it to myself. But then one day my best friend came up to me and was like. I've always wanted to try pole dancing. I was like, oh my, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thank God, that's weird. Um, so yeah, and then we searched up the bre we found the brass ring in um, Logan Square, and so we were just like, okay, let's like try it together and see what's like. And now we've both been pole dancing ever since. Cool. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>